This week on Taking Into Account, Valve makes it easier for Linux Steam users to run Windows games on their Linux machines. Also, GIMP 2.10.6 was released with a bunch of new features, bug fixes, and optimizations. A new GNOME extension allows users to put files and folders back on their GNOME desktop. Plus, middle school kids go to summer camp to learn about Linux and open source technology. And the growing revolt over the App Store tax imposed by Apple and Google. Five stories that I will be taking into account. And the first story on the docket today is the gigantic news that broke uh, yesterday. Uh, Valve announcing that they are going to make it possible for Linux Steam users to run Windows-only games on their Linux machines. How is this possible? Uh, reading a bit from this article over at Softpedia News, written by Marius Nestor, and of course I'm going to link to all the articles on today's show, uh, Valve announced today a new version of its Steam Play feature, which lets Linux, Mac, and Windows users play their games anywhere on any platform with better compatibility for Windows game titles on Linux systems. So they're trying to create this new feature, which they call Steam Play, to allow you to play whatever games you want to, regardless of operating system, and in particular, those of us that run Linux, to allow us access to play all those games in the Windows Steam catalog. Currently, there's about 3,000 games on Steam, on Steam for Linux. Um, so we have a, a pretty good collection of games now. Gaming on Linux has come a, a long way, but we're still missing a lot of the AAA titles. A lot of those are still, unfortunately, Windows-only games. So, Valve is introducing today a new and much improved Steam Play functionality which includes Proton, a modified distribution of the Wine software that lets Linux and Mac users install and run Windows games and apps on their computers to allow the installation of Windows games on Linux directly from the Linux Steam client. Basically, the guys over at Valve, they've partnered up with the folks behind Wine and Crossover, to create what they're calling Proton, which is basically their modified distribution of Wine. And this will allow Linux and Mac users to install and run Windows-only games. So now we have the over 3,000 games already for Linux. Now we have ac access to all those Windows-only games. That is the goal here. Uh, reading a little further. Our goal for this work is to let Linux Steam users enjoy access, easy access to a larger back catalog. We think it will also allow future developers to easily leverage their work on other platforms to target Linux. Basically, they're going to make Linux a much more viable platform for gaming. Uh, and it's already becoming a pretty viable platform for gaming, but still, for serious for serious gamers, especially serious like competitive gamers, you really have to run Windows, but things are changing. Things are changing. This news is gigantic. As the new and improved Steam Play feature is currently available via the latest Steam Beta client, Valve is currently testing the entire Windows game catalog to see which titles run well on the Linux platform via its Wine-based Proton emulator. So there is a beta. As a matter of fact, I opened up the Steam client last night and I uh, joined the beta. All you do is when you open Steam, go to your settings. In settings, there is an option for Steam Play. Click that tab and join the beta. Once you join the beta, then you can go ahead and try out the 27 titles. There's only 27 Windows-only titles so far that Valve has given the OK. Uh, it's what they're calling a whitelist. Among those 27 titles are Doom. That's Doom 2016, which is excellent. I may actually have to purchase that one and play it now on my Linux machine. That would be awesome. Doom 2 Hell on Earth, Doom VFR, Final Fantasy VI, and... A number of others uh, of note, Tekken 7 is also here. I might have to pick that one up. Uh, anyway, uh, however, users can also play non-whitelisted Windows-only games using a override switch. So you can tick on what they call Enable Steam Play for All Titles. There's an option. If you click that on, then you can go purchase whatever Windows game you want, and it will install via that Proton emulator. It may work, it may not. Again, this is beta, and they haven't tested every game. Right now, they have these 27 titles that they've given their blessing on. But if you want to step out of that 
and try your, your luck with some other Windows only games, by all means, go for it. Especially if you already own the uh, Windows games anyway, you have uh, Windows installation anyway. Uh, no harm, no foul. If you are like me, I only have a Linux machine. Uh, I probably am not going to bother buying any Windows only games other than the ones they've whitelisted for fear that, you know, I'm going to waste my money because I don't have a Windows box to play them on if this Proton wrapper does not work for that particular game. Anyway, gigantic news. Gigantic news. In my 10 years of using desktop Linux as my main operating system, this is easily one of the biggest pieces of news of all time. Uh, maybe top five for sure. Uh, the biggest story by far since I've been running Linux on the desktop was when Steam announced four or five years ago that they were making a Linux client. That was huge. That was a game changer for the Linux platform because before Steam, there were no games for Linux. I mean, zero. L Linux, uh, Steam for Linux changed that. I mean, we went from having practically no games to now over 3,000 games are available for Steam on Linux. And now we're about to have thousands more games that are not available natively for Linux now because we can run them in this Proton wine wrapper on Steam on our Linux box. This is gigantic news. One of the biggest stories probably of the year for sure. So uh, good job, Valve. I am going to definitely take a look at some of these games that are already whitelisted. I probably will go ahead and purchase Doom 2016 and uh, Tekken 7 just to see how they run on my Linux machine. And the second story on the docket is GIMP just saw a, a pretty impressive release. GIMP 2.10.6 was released with a bunch of new features, bug fixes, optimizations. So reading a little bit from this article here, this release announcement from GIMP.org. Almost, almost four months have passed since GIMP 2.10.0 released, and this is already the fourth version in the series. So this is the fourth point release of the 2.10 series, bringing you bug fixes, optimizations, and new features. The most notable changes are listed below. And I will just briefly hit some of the high points that I think for this release. Uh, one of the big ones here, main changes, the vertical text layers. So GIMP finally gets support for vertical text, that is top to bottom writing. This is a particularly anticipated feature for several East Asian writing systems, but also for anyone wishing to, des to design fancy vertical text. So you see here in this particular image, the vertical top to bottom writing. Really neat feature. Uh, Probably a feature that I could use, too, for even the simple stuff I do. Sometimes I do want to do this kind of vertical text, and now seems to be a uh, much, much more easier way to do it than what I've had to do in the past. Reading a little further, for this reason, GIMP provides several variants of vertical text with mixed orientation or upright orientation with right to left as well as left to right columns. So really neat. Really neat feature. All right, and they've also included two new filters in this release, 2.10.6. This first filter, I think, is really, really cool. They call this filter Little Planet. This new filter is built on top of the pre-existing GEGL operation and is fine-tuned to create what they call, quote, little planets from 360 by 180 degrees equa rectangular panorama images. So you take a pre-existing image and you run it through this filter and you get this, what they call, little planet effect. That is very, very cool. They also have this new long shadow filter. This new GEGL base filter simplifies creating long shadows in several visual styles. There is a handful of configurable options all helping you to cut extra steps from getting the desired effect. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, the straightening tool is uh, much improved. So a lot of people appreciated the new horizon straightening feature added in GIMP 2.10.4, yet many of us wanted vertical straightening as well. Now we have that as a possibility. So now we have a good horizontal straightening tool as well as a vertical straightening tool. Uh, optimized drawable preview rendering. Uh, also new localization, Mar Marathi. I'm not sure what that is, but GIMP was already available in 80 languages. Well, now it's 81 languages. So a team from North Maharashtra University worked on a on the Marathi translation and contributed near a, a nearly full translation of GIMP. So 
a GIMP now available in 81 languages. Already, it's available in Portuguese, Dutch, French, German, Greek, Italian, Latvian, Polish, Romanian, Russian, Slovenian, Spanish, Swedish, and probably 70 other languages. So, again, GIMP, just this project is so impressive, especially when you consider it's such a small development team. It's really just a couple of guys that work on GIMP full-time. Uh, it's, it's incredible uh, how good GIMP is with such a small team. A better file file dialog filtering. So a common cause of confusion confusion in GIMP is the file dialogs opening, saving, exporting. Was the presence of two file format lists, one for displaying files with a specific extension, the other for the actual file format choice. Now they've streamlined all that to make it a little less confusing for the user. So the file dialog saw some work. Um, the end of DLL hell, so this is a note to plug-in developers, uh, doesn't really apply to anything I will do, but for those of you that are doing uh, plugins for GIMP, uh, better support for that. Ongoing development, and GIMP extensions, okay, so we've got some new extensions. Head, heading, helping development, okay, I really wanted to point this out. At the bottom of this particular release announcement, we have uh, basically two guys, and these two guys have Patreon accounts. Guys, if you rely on GIMP for your work, if GIMP really is an important part of your daily desktop experience, please consider supporting the GIMP devel developers here on their Patreon pages. Uh, we have Pippin and Jihan here uh, reading a little bit of this. Keep in mind that Pippin and Jihan are able to work on GEGL and GIMP, GIMP thanks to crowdfunding and the support of the community. Every little bit helps to support their work and helps to make GIMP and GEGL even more awesome. If you have a moment, check out their support pages. I could not agree more. Great job on this release, guys. GIMP 2.10.6. And the third story on the docket tonight is there is a new GNOME extension that allows users to put their files, folders, images, whatnot, back on their desktop. So, uh, with the latest release of GNOME, GNOME 3.28, uh, basically the GNOME devs decided <clears throat> to remove icons on the desktop. They removed that feature. You can no longer place anything on your desktop. No files, folders, nothing. Uh, reading the article title here, GNOME's new desktop icons extension enters beta. So this is a beta extension. So it could have some bugs in it, some missing functionality. Reading the article here, anyone hesitant of upgrading to GNOME 3.28 because of its decision to remove desktop icons need worry no more. A new extension for GNOME Shell brings desktop icon support back to GNOME Desktop. Works almost exactly as you'd expect. And here is the full feature set. And it does include the usual suspects you would expect to be able to do on your desktop, such as open files and folders and app shortcuts, drag and drop reordering proper multi-monitor support, a link to open in terminal, cut, copy, and paste is supported, undo and redo is supported, keyboard shortcuts, Selecting multiple icons at once is supported, and it's Wayland compatible. Now, there are a couple of features that remain missing. For example, the ability to drag and drop files into folders is not supported yet. Uh, you also can't rename them outside of Nautilus or resize icons or quickly reorder them based on size, modified date, etc. So there are a few important features that probably need to be added to this extension that eventually will be. Again, this is very new, and it's beta software. Uh, I think this is pretty big news for those of you that use the GNOME desktop. I do not use the GNOME desktop. I have been very, very critical of the GNOME development team, really, since the start of GNOME 3. For one thing, my biggest complaint, of course, has always been that the GNOME desktop is a system resource hog. It is just too heavy. It's too bloated. That is always my biggest complaint, but also I've been very critical of how they remove really standard features, standard desktop features from their desktop. Uh, they have neutered their file manager, Nautilus, to the point where it's almost unusable. Uh, and then, of course, this news here where in 3.28 they decided you could no longer do anything on your desktop as far as, you know, creating files, folders, placing files and folders on your desktop. That received a lot of backlash. Now, I will give the GNOME guys uh, a little slack on this because they did have 
a pretty good reason why they did this. If you believe them, the code for how GNOME placed things on the desktop, it was old code. It was inefficient. They did not like the code, how, how it handled all that. So they wanted to get rid of it and start all, all over. So they got rid of the desktop icon feature and they arranged Nautilus in such a way they created a new API in Nautilus that would allow something like this extension to emerge, knowing somebody would create it and eventually icon support on the desktop would be a thing again. So uh, overall, I think this is a great move that this extension is out. I still wonder why basic features for your desktop environment need to be ha handled with extensions. Why are they just not part of your desktop environment by default? Uh, here in OMG Ubuntu, of course, because it's uh, Ubuntu-centric for the most part, this particular blog, although they cover a lot of different distributions. Uh, will Ubuntu ship with this extension by default? This is a great question, because Ubuntu did not uh, did not stick with 3.28, or the new code, because they wanted to keep icons on the desktop. So they actually shipped with an older version of Nautilus, so they could have icon desktop support still. Now that we have this extension, you know, maybe that's something that the Ubuntu team considers for the 18.10 release is to have that extension installed and enabled by default. So anyway, those of you that are on GNOME 3.28 and want to try out the desktop icon beta, just go over to the GNOME extension website. Uh, just click your shell version. There's only one right now, 3.28. It's the only version of GNOME shell that this will work on. Uh, you just click that, go to the extension version, uh, it looks like it's on version 4, and, you know, go through the trouble of installing it. I'm not running GNOME, so I can't install it, but good job uh, to whoever created this particular extension to make the GNOME desktop suck a little less. And the fourth story on the docket tonight is middle school kids going to summer camp to learn about Linux and open source technology. So this article over here at opensource.com I thought was just fantastic. This article was written by Dan Watkins. He titles this, Teaching Kids Linux at Summer Camp. Middle school students learn how to make broken computers useful again with Linux and open source software. So basically, reading a little bit of the article, uh, as the late great mathematician, computer scientist, and educator Seymour Peppert once said, I am convinced that the best learning takes place where the learner takes charge. Unfortunately, most schools stifle children's natural curiosity and creativity, locking down technology and reducing students to consumers of content that they have no hand in creating. Anyway, going a little further, this guy, he goes to summer camp with these middle schoolers and he has the chance to teach them a little bit about Linux, open source software, and open source technology in general. He mentions he only had three one-hour sessions with the students, but in that short time, I taught them about open source software, including Linux. I empowered them to provide IT support for their neighbors. To encourage thrift and sustainability, I decided to use older, inexpensive, and easy-to-get hardware. Five older laptop computers that were recently placed in my custody. So, five laptops that are, were garbage, basically. Probably people were throwing away, giving away, donating to charity. He got five of these older machines that probably could never run modern versions of Windows, like Windows 10. He took them to camp for these kids to play play with. Reading a little further, I also pub purchased a dozen or so USB drives and printed out some material about Linux from the Linux Foundation to use as handouts. I downloaded Fedora 28 Workstation, Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, Linux Lite, and Ubermix, and burned the ISO files to the USB drives using Etcher. I also created a classroom wiki with links to the distributions I had chosen and the Linux Foundation's educational materials. Anyway, very nice picture here of the middle schoolers with the laptops. It looks like, uh, uh, what are they using? Might be HP laptops. It's hard to tell. Uh, maybe a variety of different laptops. The one here in the front here could be an HP. Hmm. Anyway, setting up the hardware, at the start of the camp, I told the students that people are, norm are usually convinced that a computer with a crashed operating system is no good anymore. That's probably how he got the five laptops he's using, is that people thought because, you know, Windows was not working on them, that they were no longer functional, that they were garbage. <laughs> anyway, he taught these kids otherwise. He basically helped these kids burn 
Linux ISOs, install Linux on those, these machines, and revive these older computers. Very, very cool. I love when people start teaching kids about free software and open source software at a young age. Anyway, he walked them through uh, using a live Linux uh, boot device. He explained the similarities and differences between popular distros like Fedora and Ubuntu, yada, yada, yada. Uh, he also taught them about certain free and open source software applications such as LibreOffice Writer, GIMP, Audacity, Stellarium, Celestia, GNU Chess, Sudoku, G Compress, TuxMath, and Inkscape. <laughs> very, very cool. I, I love seeing stories like this. He taught them how to use certain commands in the terminal, Cal, Top, Kill, LS. Uh, wrapping it up, he says the students learn to do a, a lot very quickly. And at the time of at the end of our time together, I gave each of their own I gave each their own Linux installation media to take home. To inspire them to learn more about Linux, I gave them a handout with links to the Fedora, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and other distributions along with simple instructions how to download and create bootable USB drives and installation media. Uh, you know what? This is just fantastic. I want to see more of this, these kinds of stories out there because really if the free software movement and the open source software movement and Linux, you know, if they're ever going to become mainstream in the public's mind, we really have to focus on the younger generation. It all starts with the kids. You know, it's all about the kids. So really, really, this, this warmed my heart uh, reading this story. Love this. And the fifth and final story on the docket tonight is the growing revolt over the App Store tax imposed by the likes of Apple and Google. So, reading o over here at Bloomberg.com, Apple and Google face growing revolt over the App Store tax. This article is written by Mark Bergen and Christopher Palmieri. A backlash against the app stores of Apple and Google is gaining steam, with a growing number of companies saying the tech gi giants are collecting too high a tax for connecting consumers to developer wares. And some large companies are really starting to push this. Netflix, Epic Games, Valve are among the companies that have recently tried to bypass the app stores and complained about the cost of the tolls Apple and Google charge. Grumbling about the app store economics isn't new, but the number of complaints combined with the new ways of reaching users, regulatory scrutiny, and competitive pressure are threatening to undermine what have become digital gold mines for Apple and Google. And... When he says digital gold mines here, he is absolutely right. Apple, in particular, and Google make many, many, many billions of dollars off of the imposed taxes on that web store, on, on their uh, app stores, that is. Uh, Apple, of course, and Google, very large companies. Apple is a trillion-dollar company now. So, uh, reading a little further in the article, it feels like something is bubbling up here. The dollars are just getting so big, they just don't want to be paying Apple and Google billions. So, you know, in the early days, it made sense for Apple and Google to take 30% or whatever from the App Store as far as that tax. But because of the numbers involved now with how many people are on mobile devices, on iPhones and Android devices, you know, we're talking tens of billions of dollars made off of these store, stores every year. And it's getting to the point where people say, enough is enough, lower your fees. So Apple and Google, they launched their app stores in 2008, and they soon grew into powerful marketplaces that matched the creation of millions of independent developers with billions of smartphone users. In exchange, the companies initially took up to 30% of the money consumers paid developers. Uh, and mentioning why... This is starting to gain some steam here is because the numbers involved last year, uh, the App Store economy was $82 billion. It is projected to grow to $157 billion by 2022. Just insane the amount of money that Apple and Google are making off their App Store. Uh, Anyway, so it's got some companies worried here, especially, you know, some of the bigger companies like Netflix, Valve, Epic Games. Uh, they don't want to be paying this tax anymore. They're asking Apple and Google, lower your fees. If you can't lower your fees, basically, they're going to just try to bypass the App Store altogether if they can. So uh, Apple and Google take, you know, 30% of subscription dollars and in-app purchases made on iPhones and Android devices. Uh 
if app store commissions fell to a blended rate of 5% to 15%, now this is interesting, if app store commissions fell to a blended rate of 5% to 15%, that would knock up to 21% off of Apple's earnings. So you can imagine how people invested in Apple and Google, for that matter, are very concerned about this because this is a big chunk of their profit, right? This is, a, especially for Apple, this is a big chunk of their revenue. So uh, Google could lose up to 20% by that same measure. So big chunk for them too. The technology giants, Apple and Google, they're expected to earn more than $50 billion each before interest and tax in 2020 from their app stores. Particularly worrying for Apple investors, again, because Apple actually touts their fi financial success of their app store. They like to mention it on conference calls and whatnot, uh, you know, part of their business model, a big chunk of it, is that App Store. So this has folks at Apple and Google concerned, as it should be. Probably has a lot of investors in those two companies concerned as well. Uh, reading a little bit more, the video game industries work to avoid App Store taxes this year. Valve, the largest distributor of video games for PCs, plan to release a free iPhone app that lets gamers keep playing while away from their computers. Apple blocked the app. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Soon after, the tech giant updated its app review guidelines to ban anything that looks like an app store within an app or gives users the ability to browse, select, purchase software not already owned and licensed. So basically, Apple said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you got to go through us. Uh, more recently, Epic Games, the maker of the hit video game Fortnite. I'm sure a lot of you guys know Fortnite. Uh, unfortunately, not available on Linux, but many of you probably have Windows machines as well. Fortnite's an insanely popular game. Anyway, Epic Games opted to ditch Google's App Store. Epic exec executive Tim Sweeney said the 30% App Store fee is high cost in a world where publishers must bear the expense of developing, operating, and supporting their games. So they just said 30% no way. You know, basically, they gave a big screw you to uh, Google's App Store. <laughs> so, and uh, this is becoming more and more common. Apple and Google are both facing backlash, especially from other large companies uh, that want to publish their software in their stores. So we'll see where this goes. I do think eventually they will have to modify their uh, fee structure a little bit. 30% is outrageous for Apple and Google to be charging for this supposed App Store tax, <laughs> quote unquote tax. Uh, anyway, we'll see how that goes. And that was the fifth and final story for this episode of Taking Into Account. This was Taking Into Account Episode 5. I've been releasing Taking Into Account every Thursday. So that is my plan going forward, is to release a new episode every week on Thursday, sometime Thursday, every week. So I hope you guys have been enjoying the new show. I hope you guys like the format. If anything, you know, uh, you got questions or concerns about the format, uh, suggestions, please Feel free to comment on the video. Uh, I will definitely uh, read those and take anything you, you guys have to say into consideration. As always, before I go, other than the five main stories, I like to do some kind of viewer feedback, either a question I got through email or Mastodon or even, you know, YouTube comments. So I got this question the other day. It was a few days ago, but I thought, you know, it deserves some time here on the show. And I, this was a private message on Mastodon, so I won't link to the fella's name. But hey, DT, any advice how one can fix a kernel panic? I installed BSPWM, which is a tiling window manager, using XBPS, which is Void Linux's package manager. He got it, though, on the Arch user repository, the AUR. So he installed Void Linux's package manager, XBPS, from the AUR on his Manjaro install, and he installed the BSPWM Tiling Window Manager <laughs> using XBPS. Uh, I guess he rebooted the computer. He got a kernel panic, frowny face. <laughs> How do you fix a kernel panic? Uh, I, I'm not even going to attempt to try to work out how to fix a kernel panic. Usually when I get a kernel panic, I just reinstall. It's much simpler, especially on most modern distributions, especially something like Manjaro. Uh, you got good backups. You can be up and running again in 15 minutes. Just reinstall. Um, my concern here is you guys that like to tinker, and I'm, I'm a tinkerer, but why would you install BSPWM 
through Void Linux's package manager, XBPS, rather than using Pac-Man, the native Arch Linux package manager that's also native to Manjaro. Why did you install XBPS on your Arch-based Linux distribution in the first place? In the first place, and then uh, frowny face, you're surprised that something broke. Uh, you probably should have already planned on stuff breaking, and I hope you had good backups. Uh, so, uh, how to fix a kernel panic? Uh, I'm not going to give you advice on that. My only advice is be more careful what you do. Be be sure you have good backups when you play around with this sort of thing, and also just reinstall when you get a kernel panic. Uh, I'm not going to try to fix a kernel panic because, again, most Linux distributions, even mainline Arch, I can be up and running again within an hour. There's no reason for me to try to, uh, to fix a kernel panic, assuming, again, you have good backups. One last thing I will mention before I go. Some of you guys are going to be wondering about the camera, camera angle for this particular video. I got a brand new camera in just before I started recording this video, a brand new Panasonic Lumix G7, and I was curious how it would work, so I plugged it in and played around with it a little bit in OBS. I had to record this video today, so I just went ahead, and you know what, for a good test run for this camera, I used my Panasonic Lumix G7 to, to make this video. I know the camera angle is a little strange because I, I didn't have a, a good tripod for it, and, and it, the room I'm in, I didn't, didn't have a good spot for that particular camera. I'm just happy it works. Uh, the picture on it looks gorgeous. It is a DSLR camera with clean uh, uh, HDM, HDMI output. I'm capturing it using the Elgato Cam Link that I showed you guys on a previous video, but I'm going to do a dedicated video to the camera, to the, the Cam Link, and the whole video setup. Uh, very shortly on the channel. Anyway, again, this was just me testing the camera, but since I had to make this video anyway, I figured this was a good test run, so please don't beat me up in the comments over the camera angle. <laughs> anyway, before I go, I do have to give a special thanks to my patrons, all my Patreon supporters, and of course I'm talking about A.K. Allen, Alex, Ansem, Tony, Bart, Benjamin, Ben, Bruno, Brian, Carlos, Christian, Chuck, Dan, The Other Dan, Daniel, David, The Other David, Eduardo, Greg, Humay, Interceptor, Jake, John, Carl, Katrina, Keith, Leo, Marcus, The Other Marcus, Matt, Mark, Martin, Matthias, Michael, Mr. GFY, Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. Newly Pops, Paul, Rob, Robert, Ron, Silvio, First Stephen, Second Stephen, Third Stephen, Swami, Tiedemann, and Voice Live, Tubella, and John, you guys rock. You guys, you guys help make this show possible. Peace, guys.